Hello and welcome. Today we're going to be telling you what we really think about Prehistoric Planet 2. We'll be ranking the episodes and telling you our favourite bits from the series. Now, if you've not watched the show, I suggest that you go and watch it before you listen to this because there are going to be some spoilers on the way. So, episode one, Islands. Walk us through the opening scene. What happens? Well, we start off at the coast and it's just after the aftermath of a huge tropical storm. And this yes. storm has broken up chunks of the land um, and broken bits of vegetation it's all logs, floating out and they've all the clumped together to form rafts and uh, on these rafts we see some small dinosaurs uh, that are being washed out on these rafts mm. out into the open sea uh, I forget the name of the animal what was it there's so many different animals there's a small pterosaur um, first and then later we see a Zulmoxes I think if I pronounce that right yes. who's piloting his own little raft <laughs> and, um, yes. but then we see we are introduced to the mosasaur yes. beneath the surface. A huge the mosasaur water. is lurking around, looking for any animals that may have been dragged into the sea uh, from this huge storm. So he's taking advantage of this to, to see if there's any strand, uh, stranded animals he can uh, take advantage of and hunt them down. Mm. And he does try to get one of the little dinosaurs, but it just manages uh, to get away. Yes, I thought he was going to get caught, to be honest myself. I was uh, <laughs> slightly concerned for him. But he did get away from the Mosasaur and he managed to find a new raft and that's where he meets a female uh, yes, version of his species. Yes, a girlfriend. <laughs> yes, yes. So, um, and then they sail off into the sunset to find a new continent maybe. Or a and different then, island somewhere, yes. A, that's a right. habitat. And I think that's really good at how it shows how dinosaurs would have spread across the globe and eventually evolve into a new species of dinosaur. Yes, yes, because wherever they're going to uh, land, wherever that raft takes them, uh, mm. some may possibly die, but the ones that do survive and do land on different areas, uh, they're going to have to adapt to be able to cope with a different new environment. So that shows how many different species would have evolved you know, into uh, different groups of dinosaurs. So I thought that was really interesting, that, to show how dinosaurs spread around uh, the planet. Yes, uh, yeah, I agree. Good. I agree. So, what did you think of the overall opening scene? Were you gripped? I was. I was with the mosasaur because that was like, oh, you know, is it going to get away or is the mosasaur going to get it? Um, but I, I don't know. I don't think it was as strong as a scene as the first, um, you know, pre in season one, one yeah, episode yeah. one. Uh, just because I think when it first started, uh, episode one. Uh, of, of season one we see obviously the t-rex and it's not just it's a t-rex it's a t-rex swimming yeah. so you're immediately like oh my god it's a t-rex what it's swimming like, i i don't expect this so you you grip straight away and then before you even have the time to be like oh wow a t-rex a mosasaur comes in and is about to hunt the chicks and you're yeah. like oh no no i don't want the baby to get eaten so you you're very um you know, you gripped right from the beginning, um, from that opening scene. This one was a bit more relaxed, wasn't it? A bit more of a relaxed well, opening. I think um, it could have just been a bit more, I don't know, a bit more of a, you know, dramatic or, you know... Shocking some, scene. Some, something that was going to really go, oh my, wow, I'm ready for this. You know, like, when you think of, um, you know, the, the opening scene in Jurassic Park with the Brachiosaurus, you're like, yeah, I'm yeah. ready for this now, you know what I mean? I'm ready to see mm. dinosaurs. With this, I think it could have just been, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not... Um, I don't mean to to criticise it too much, but I think it could have just been a bit of a more, you know, they could have uh, had something a little bit more epic to start off with. But that's I, fair I, enough, I, I think. I, yeah, yeah. I can't knock it though. The, the, the CGI and effects of of the creatures are absolutely spectacular. Mm. I think if you you were disappointed by the the intro, then the second scene certainly makes yes. up for it. Yes. With the small dwarfed uh, hadrosaurs, I think they're called Kathy Cedros. Again, I'm not <laughs> sure if I'm pronouncing that right. Um, they are quite difficult to pronounce yeah. and a lot, spell. A lot of these also. animals I haven't heard of before, uh, which I think is is really good. You know, we're, it's we're good seeing that different. You creatures not going ones. for the classics like Triceratops, you know, Tyrannosaurus Rex, and, and creatures like that. We're actually going for animals that you know a lot of uh dinosaur fans may have not even heard of before. So, I think that's a good mm. thing because it's bringing those creatures into the light. 
Uh, but yeah, the, the, the reason they were dwarfed is because they were living on uh, small islands. So obviously there's not as much uh, vegetation for them to eat. So that limits their growth size. They can't grow as big. Um, and because of this, they make themselves uh, prey to a very terrifying creature. Um, it's the Hatsigoptrix. Yes. That no. flies in and... <laughs> Pounces on the the poor hadrosaurs. Yeah, that was who, a great scene. That I really enjoyed. So it's that. they're like on an island, and there's they're like grazing in the in, in the middle of a forest, mm-hmm. you know, all the on the outskirts of a forest, should I say? And these Hatsigoptrix swoop in um, and just pick one of the hadrosaurs straight up, one of the baby ones, and just <laughs> swallows it whole, <laughs> um, which is absolutely terrifying. terrifying yeah. When the others run off into the forest. Um, and then, but some are still stuck, aren't they, in the grass, and they're trying to hide from it, which is a yeah, bit of a babies eerie are trying to keep, scene. Yeah, the, the babies are trying to hide, and the mother, they go into the forest, don't they? And the, because the birds are so big, they can't actually fit into the, the, the forest because the forest is so dense. And you think this, this animal is the size of a giraffe, you know, it's as tall as a giraffe. Its beak, was it two... Two meters, I think it was. Its beak is two meters. It was big. It was like a javelin. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you don't want to get pecked by that. Definitely not. And the, and what I like as well at the end, uh, they talk about these animals hunting, and um, they're saying that if they were alive today, we would be on the menu because we are the scary perfect thought. size. For <laughs> yeah. Imagine just walking around in your da- daily life, and then this dragon just swoops yeah. over, comes down, and just oh. You're walking down the street, going to get feet. some milk, and then suddenly, oh my god! You're swept off your feet. It's uh, it, it's a scary by thought. But that, no, that was a really good scene, and it was just really eerie. That the noises as you heard them thud down on the ground, and they were running round. They almost ran them. on on all foot, they, like with their legs, and then they kind of galloped almost yeah, forward yeah, on their yeah. um, on their wings, which was interesting. That I thought, yeah, it was no, it was really really good. Um, and I must say that the males had this huge crest on the top of the head with beautiful colours. Yeah. Uh, the females, they, they didn't have as much of a crest um, and they weren't as, as colourful as the males. So I think that's good as well. So they're showing the indicating uh, between male and female. Mm. Um, you know, the males had this display to try and impress them. And they're also hunting together as a group. It wasn't just they were hunting um, mm. alone. Uh, it reminded me a bit of... Um, are they called Harris Hawks, I think? Harris Hawks uh, hunt together in packs, uh, hunting lizards and things like that. And, and it's, it's quite, uh, you know, scary to think, you know, imagine hiding in the undergrowth and you just see this giant beak just, oh God, it's uh, it's scary, scary stuff, I must say. <laughs> I think that would possibly would be the best scene of, of the episode, I think, or one of the best um, just the way it was mm. played out, it was very, very good. Well, up next in the next scene is the Simosuchus. I think there's uh, a lot of memes been made regarding yes. this dinosaur. You may have seen him um, poking his head over the rock or in the grass. Yes. Uh, and this is the crocodile-looking dinosaur. Um, but strangely, it's a herbivore. Mm. It doesn't eat meat. Now, this, this must be because of the teeth. They must have looked at the teeth and realised that this animal definitely is a mm. herbivore. Um, maybe it's because it's on Madagascar and maybe possibly... I mean, I don't know, there's pre- plenty of food to eat. I wonder why it's adapted to eat leaves. Yeah, it, I think it's a, if that was to evolve into crocodiles, that's a very drastic change along the evolutionary process to go from... Well, there were crocodiles to... around at this point. This is just one that's branched off and, and started to eat vegetation. Oh, right, okay. So it's, uh, it's interesting. I'm thinking maybe it's because there's so much competition on this island. Even though Madagascar is a big island, maybe to avoid competition, it started to eat uh, a herbivorous diet, possibly. I don't know. Mm. Um, but uh, th- there was a section in this where we see the, the classic hunter yes. of... Uh, the Jungasaurus. Uh, yes, the Jungasaurus. It steps on screen. It's big. It's chunky. It's got the um, no shrink wrapping. The, the little all. horn on its its head, and uh, it just looks good, doesn't it? I, just, I think it comes on the the scene. You can just see it's like thigh and its leg, and it's just mm. wallowing onto the screen, yeah. and then it's just looking um, yeah. at these Simosaurus, uh, Simosuchus, sorry, um, 
and then a hunt scene begins. Yeah, but what I like about this is the nice little touch of detail that they put in is that female was blind in one eye. Ah, yes, I remember. Um, which I thought was good because, you, uh, you know, you don't know what's happened. She must have been in a scrap or a fight or something. Mm. And you would have animals like this, you know, when you think of the type of lives that dinosaurs have. I mean, look at animals today, lions and, you know, all these creatures today, the fights they get in. So... God knows what's happened to her there. Yeah, I think that could be a little backstory, maybe, if there's a season three. Possibly, (laughs) possibly, who knows. Um, So we see the Majungasaurus chase one of these creatures, and now they have burrows, don't they? They have little burrows at the, these little safety tunnels that they've Mm. made in advance. Um, You see a lot of them, a lot of them scurry into their burrow. Unfortunately, one is... Well, you can't get in. Can't, can't get in. There's not enough room in the tunnels, and he's stuck, and he has to have a face off with Majungasaurus. Now, what did you think of this? But I remember you looking at me with a screwed up face, going, "What on earth is going on?" <laughs> yes, <laughs> I thought, "What is Majungasaurus doing?" I thought, like, "Come on, the Majungasaurus can take that Samosuchus." <laughs> but the Samosuchus did some kind of little dance. He waved his tail. He hissed. He he cackled mm. at the Majungasaurus and. And then he just ran in the burrow, and the Majungasaurus was left there, flabbergasted. He couldn't believe that he'd he'd um, yeah been tricked. In that I don't way. know. I think I think this bit was a little bit. I don't know. It looked a bit off at the beginning, but the more I thought about it, I think you look at things like honey badgers, um, and they're smaller than uh, lions, and they will take on a lion. They will they'll go for a lion. Mm. In fact, cheetah cubs actually they're they're. The cheetah's uh, cubs actually have a... Um, the fur. The fur born. resembles that of a, uh, a honey badger because yeah. they know. It's weird how it's just evolved that way because creatures will not go near honey badgers. Yeah. So it's because a good just... protection for the cheetah cubs because they look like yeah, a honey badger. Yeah. And that says a lot about the honey badger, yeah. that it's so vicious and, and can defend itself. So, I mean, yeah. I guess it's possible. I mean, I've seen a monitor lizard getting attacked by uh, lions and the monitor lizard is whipping them with its tail Hmm. and the lions are like what what the hell's going on you know but I'm not so sure maybe it was just the animation looked a bit odd the way it was flicking its tail and and I don't know but it it definitely is possible it's something that it's definitely possible and it depends on the the um you know the personality and temperament of the actual dinosaur itself. I guess you know you might have some dinosaurs that were, you know some majungasaurus might have just bit straight into it and not been yeah, phased. Not even fall one for might it. be a bit more timid, a bit more you know wary, mm. uh, and it's blind in one eye. So I guess that's a, a weakness, and it might be you know just a bit cautious, and he's just been a bit cautious for too long, and his meal has went straight down into the yeah. burrow and escaped. Um, yes. But nevertheless, I thought it was a good scene. I did enjoy seeing Majungasaurus. Yes, and I, I do like that it wasn't shrink wrapped at all. It was very, very chunky. Yeah, uh, a lot of muscle, a lot of fat and hide on this animal. It was, it was very well fed, even though it was blind. Yes, um, it was. <laughs> yes. Um, and what's the next scene? Now? So the next scene is it's not a dinosaur or a reptile. It's a mammal. So this uh, is the yeah. mammal scene, and um, I believe it's the Adalatherium. Um, so we see the Adalatherium. It's like a. It looks like a small like raccoon or badger uh, type animal, and it's walking across uh, some kind of like a desert, you know, like scrubland. And uh, I think it's uh, hunting, and it goes um, back to the nest. It has cubs um, or little little furry um, pups. I think you'd call them. Well, actually, before before that, they're actually in eggs. Yes. Um, which I thought was really interesting because we're actually showing. That, you know, when you think of a mammal, you think, oh, they give birth to live young, but this is an actual uh, a mammal that um, has branched off. It's in between a reptile almost and well, a mammal. There's, there's, back in the Triassic period, we had a split between mammals and reptiles, and some have obviously stayed and not evolved as much and still lay eggs. So she's warm-blooded, uh, but she's actually... Um, She's actually still laying eggs, which is really interesting. Mm-hmm. And um, when the eggs do hatch, uh, she does produce milk like a mammal would. Yes. Um, and I thought it was interesting how he how he uh, actually said that happened um, when when David Attenborough said he said through sweat glands, through sweat glands, yeah. as yeah. disgusting as that sounds. <laughs> but that's how milk actually happened at first. It was, it's just from a gland that uh, produced sweat, and in the sweat will obviously be. Uh, 
you know fat and stuff like that nutrients so over time and millions of years of evolution uh, this has just developed into a way of uh, providing food for the young and there are actually some mammals still alive today that still do lay eggs uh, the platypus uh, that lives in Australia, and also the echidna, which also lives in Australia as and well. That's it's like a small it's hedgehog. It's like a spiky hedgehog with a pointed nose, yes. There you go. So there's still some among us. Yeah. And what I like about that is they're actually putting in mammals. It's not just dinosaur focused. They're actually putting in, you know, it, it really paints a picture of this world that, uh, you know, when the, the, the dinosaurs lived in. It wasn't just loads of scaly beasts. There were also uh, small little mammals scurrying about, waiting mm. for the moment to uh, to take over, waiting for their chance. <laughs> so, it. yeah, very good. I like it. So the next scene is with the improbata, which is the raptors. The oh, raptor yeah. style raptors. ones, the ones another the dinosaur s- I've never heard of. In the in the, in the snow, <laughs> yes. so it's um, it's like an ice lake with some obviously some snowy forests around, and there I think it starts. It's got like a, a scene with a heated camera, isn't it? I really like that. And it looks yeah. It it makes you really feel like it's real because it comes on with a heated mm. camera. You can see them huddled up together to keep warm uh, before they go out on a hunt, mm-hmm. and uh, they're hunting a dinosaur called. Morosaurus. Yes. Um, and what's interesting, the, the, both of these dinosaurs have got feathers. Yes. Well, the, you know, insulation for the uh, for the cold, especially for the snow and everything. Yes. So you see the uh, improbatas basically coming down the snowy mountain, uh, going down through the trees, and they're hunting this Morosaurus, and then they end up chasing it across mm. the ice. All of them are slipping and sliding, um, <laughs> and in that they actually fail the hunt they actually don't get it yes well most hunts would have and they always say most hunts end in failure Mm -hmm. um so i thought but i did think it was a good chase you know uh, as they were all slipping on the ice trying to get a grip and they're falling over all over the place um i thought it was was a good hunt it was good yeah i thought it was good when um the morosaurus got to the edge of the ice and i think david pointed out that he could possibly you know break the ice they didn't know how thick the ice was if the morosaurus ran across he could have broke Mm. he could have gone straight under the ice but it was a decision between risking it on the ice or being eaten alive by the improbata (laughs) on the other side so I thought that was very good yeah yeah it had to take the risk in the end and uh, it did and it paid off yes yes. it survived (laughs) managed to get away yeah very good scene and on to the final scene. So ah, this yes. comes back to the Hatsigotrix. No, the I like one that, that was I like how it comes back to all to the catch up with it. Yeah. Um, and he was carrying one of them in his in his beak, wasn't That's it? That's right. And he carries this um, dead uh, miniature hadrosaur to an island and there he puts the prey down on the floor um, and then starts making a display like with uh, logs, doesn't he? And mm-hmm. starts making like a shapes in the sand and things like that and uh, that reminded me very much of um, uh, birds of paradise you know when they start um, you know these birds that start moving Making, things about yeah. and putting a flower here or, or, oh I'm going to move this stick over here in this way and you know they collect little objects don't they to try and put mm-hmm. make a display to attract a female I see and it makes sense since they're like flying reptiles they'd always be high and above and yeah, it's all it's down, almost like yeah. making a you know for example when ourselves as humans make an SOS you know yeah. from the sky it would be very easily visible yeah. uh, to other you know pterosaurs that would be flying by and they would see this display especially in the white sand it would mm-hmm. be very easily visible and they'd say there's a potential mate and then yeah. a female flies it's down. a good way to advertise isn't it you know it's great it's here big, I am it's a big <laughs> come and get me it's a big billboard <laughs> essentially isn't it yes and they would have had very good eyesight as well because they would have needed that to be able to um you know, see prey mm-hmm. on the ground and, and also, um, yeah. you know, look out for a mate. Uh, but this scene was really good. We see a female land and uh, she's weighing up the male, deciding whether he's worthy or not. And um, But it, they're interrupted yes. by a cheeky <laughs> other male who yes. flies down to try, uh, get his, try, his, uh, try his hand at um, fighting the other male and winning the female. Um, I thought it was good as well because you see again the... The ability of the pterosaurs to kind of like fight uh, yeah. on land, he just kind of he runs and charges straight at him. You know, pecking each other. One one 
wrong pack and they could mm. they could kill each other with one pack you know they could impale one of them so you've got to be very careful uh, not to get stabbed with one of those javelins that's um, it yeah so we're and that the challenger he, he more or less goes straight away doesn't he he comes yeah, and he chases him off. off and the female comes back down and he's gone yeah uh, and she's very down. impressed with that and she's also impressed they're saying like how he's managed to carry um the dead dinosaur that he's killed it shows he's a good hunter but also yes. he's very strong to be able to carry this dinosaur all the way out yeah. to here you know because that dinosaur would have weighed a ton you know yeah yeah even though it's small mouth. it still would have weighed quite a bit because mm. these animals um they have hollow bones don't they the pterosaurs they only weigh that mm. they don't weigh much even though they're big they're very lightly built uh, so to carry this dinosaur, you know, would have been quite a, a drag on its body, you yeah, know, definitely. trying to keep that up. Well, that shows that he's got good genes and he can obviously yes, produce yes. good offspring and they will survive and continue the bloodline yes. of their dinosaur <laughs> yeah. species. Yeah, it's very good. Mm -hmm. So that was episode one. So guys, let us know what you thought of episode one. Put it down in the comments. And we'll go straight on to episode two, which is The Badlands. Mm. So this episode starts off very dramatically with lava spewing out of a volcano. Uh, lots of, uh, you know, Ash, deadly gases. Smoke, gases. And then you see a herd of sauropods walking through this very you know. terrible environment <laughs> yes. and you think what are they doing here <laughs> and it turns out that they're actually going there because of the geothermal incubation the heat of the volcano is a great place to put their eggs yes uh, and you see this with modern day animals there's actually a uh, certain species of iguana um, I was going to say iguana on then <laughs> iguana um, that crawl down into the crater of volcanoes and they lay their eggs in the ash because of the heat that the volcano you know mm. provides to keep their eggs warm um, and what I like about this episode as well at the very end I love the little scientific um, yes evidence bits where they, they show where they've got uh, they explain how the science backs up what's yeah. been seen in that episode and I like this because they say that they see um that they've been coming back in two because there's layers of ash uh, and lava that have, have come down, settled. Then you see eggs, then you see another layer of lava, and you just see generations and generations and generations of different um, eggs being laid. Uh, so it shows that they were coming back here. It wasn't just a one off, they were coming back here, you know, several mm. times. Over this was definitely a habitual thing that was either. You know, seasonal. Every time they, they they bred, the babies would then leave, and they would then come back to lay their mm -hmm. eggs, and it would repeat in that process. I thought it was a good idea. I liked it. Yeah, it was good, and also the fact that they've got such long necks is great because all those gases uh, that were condensed down on the floor that would make other yes. animals die or pass out. Because it was quite a, a toxic cocktail mix. I think it was carbon dioxide and sulfur dioxide, yes. which would really well it just completely kill most dinosaurs. But like I say, the sauropods them long necks to keep above the gases and get that fresh air at the top mm -hmm. um, and it's a good it's a good idea really because you think predators are going to stay away from your eggs then you know what I mean so it's almost like a moat around a castle yes but instead it's a gas that's surrounding <laughs> the uh, where all your eggs are and I thought what was interesting the eggs were the size of a melon yeah. <laughs> well they're big animals that is a big you know? egg yes <laughs> Uh, but no, I thought it was really good. I look, I love how chunky as well the um, sauropods look. Their necks were very, very thick. They mm. weren't these little spindly necks. They were very thick, and they also had um, what you see on iguanas those uh, those scales little, that are pointed on the yes, back of the yeah. neck, uh, going all the way down the neck and on the back as well. Uh, yeah, I love the design of uh, those sauropods. What were they called? Isosaurs. Ice, Isosaurs. They were called. Yes, yes. Isosaurs. Beautiful, beautiful dinosaur. Certainly were. <laughs> so on to the next scene, which is a family of velociraptors. Oh, so velociraptors. probably one of a lot of people's favourite dinosaurs, uh, and they made a reappearance. And they are in the canyons, the, the desert canyons. Yes. Uh, there's caves and caverns. I thought it was a really cool um, area and environment for them to be lurking about. There's something very you know creepy and you know sneaky about velociraptors, and I mm. thought that they suited creeping around the canyons and you know and setting up the ambush later on in the episode yes we see uh, three different herbivores 
Uh, there's two sauropods. Uh, yes. I think it was Mug- Molu- one of the Mongolian titanosaur. Yes, and uh, another smaller one, which I thought was interesting. There was two different groups of sauropods traveling, traveling together. together. Uh, and also, what were they called? Prefo, prefo- uh, Prenocephaly. Cephaly. Prenocephaly, <laughs> if we're saying that correct. And they're um, like the smaller dinosaur, the yeah. theropod ones. But I thought it was cool that they're all traveling together. Um, probably the smaller ones, the Prefocephaly, are, are going along with these guys because they're so huge. It provides mm. some protection. A lot of, you kind of see it like with... Um, Sharks, don't you? And whales, you see these exactly. fish staying close to the big whale to keep safe, you know, keep itself, um, you know, predators to be put off uh, from coming and attacking. Um, but yeah, this is where we see an ambush scene uh, take place. Well, soon the Tarbosaurus turn up. Yes. They uh, make their entrance onto the scene. Um, I thought it was a really cool scene. You know, the, the sauropods and the herbivores are going down the canyon. It almost reminded me of the scene with the Carnotaurus and the herd in Dinosaur, where Aladar, ah, yes. where, they, where, they, where they meet them in the canyon and they're stuck and they have to make a bit of a, a, bit of a standoff. Ah, yes. Reminded me of that scene, it was very good. Um, but the Tabasaurus scare them and it goes into a bit of a panic. Mm, and we see Some one trip and fall. Stumble um, over each other. And that one, I'm assuming... Uh, it got trampled over by the others because it was at the front of the herd and it slipped and fell. Very possible, and yeah. And the others uh, seem to just keep walking over that one. Yes. Um, but then the Prenocephaly, they, mm. because they're smaller, they decide to try and run up into the canyons and, yes. and they escape. And that's when this... I, I was completely shocked when I saw it, this scene where it's running up and then one of the Velociraptors just karate kicks <laughs> the Prenocephaly <laughs> Off the cliff, I couldn't believe it. Yeah, but I thought it was interesting as well how it set it up because one velociraptor mm. chased them uh, into this uh, t- towards the other velociraptor that was waiting round the corner. So it shows they're very smart. You know, mm. one's chasing them, leading them to the other, and the other one's waiting around the corner. And as soon as it came round, bang, just kicked off the cliff. That's it. And mean, I thought, it, it, you know, it's really clever that because rather than have a fight and risk injury, why not just kick your prey off the cliff? And let gravity mm. do the work. Exactly yeah. that. It shows the the thought process that's gone into it. Mm. They thought we'll lure them up to a higher place. We'll have multiple pack members in different places, and it's been executed perfectly. And they, yes. they kicked the poor Prenocephaly off, <laughs> and, and then gone, gone and collected their prize. You've got to think of the power in those kicks as well. When they're kicking up, they've not just got the claws. You know the power of the kick, mm. and then slicing them with this huge curved claw. And not only that, you know, the fact that it's fell off, you know, so it doesn't even have to use its claw. If the claw doesn't get you, you know, you're going to die from falling off the cliff. Um, but yeah, I thought it was a really good scene. It was really cool. And then, uh, obviously, the... Um, Tabasaurus, uh, Tabasaurus makes a kill as well. Yes. Um, and they're, uh, I think, one of the sauropods, isn't it? Mm. I do think, though, they're very l- reluctant to show any violence. Yes. Um when you think of walking with dinosaurs, uh, that show would show blood, guts, the lot. You know, it was not shy of showing dinosaurs getting into fights. Um, and at the end, we see the sauropod that's obviously uh, it's got trampled over, mm. and the, t- the Tabasaurus come around it, and you see them begin to eat, but it doesn't show any blood. You know, no, no fighting or anything. I feel they're a little bit. Uh, the scenes are quite well navigated to avoid any yeah. blood or anything too graphic. I think, which mm. is which is I suppose it's good because it, it makes it a bit more friendly to certain audiences. But then there is that. That argument that we want to see a bit of a bit of gore <laughs> in these episodes. I just think with some of these animals, when you look at you know lions taking down wildebeest and you know buffalo and things like that, and then you think of a tarbosaur, the size of this animal taking on a sauropod that's just enormous. I want to mm. see the power. I want to see the bite force and this animal, what it could, really can do. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, I would like to see tarbosaurus have a bit more action. You know, mm. grabbing them, fighting. You know, a bit like that. But I think it does make sense, from a predator's point of view, it does make sense. Just let them do the work for you. Let them trample over each other, stand mm-hmm. back. You've caused a panic. Now I'll move in and just uh, take the spoils rather than risk That's injury it. trying to uh, work, kill something. Work smart and not that hard, so mm, it makes sense. Yes. <laughs> so the next scene is the egg thief scene. Uh, so there's one of these dinosaurs that are looking to steal uh, the other dinosaurs' uh, dinosaurs' eggs. 
Um, and he's, he's the relative to... of vel- Velociraptor, isn't it? That's yes, her. that's right. Yes, and um, and it's under the cover of darkness that she chooses to do this because she has uh, excellent vision. Um, and she sneaks in, and what I like about this is she doesn't just steal one egg and run off with it. She stays there and eats as many eggs as she can, mm. uh, and waits until she actually gets discovered, and then grabs one and legs it and runs off. And uh, then she feeds her young with this egg that she's she's stolen. That's, so that's right, and it good. goes on about how it's showing that the young have to identify this egg as food. So it's mm. almost the, the process of the. The adult teaching the young as well that this is food, and then that shows how the dinosaurs then learn, and then when they grow up, they'll also go and uh, steal more eggs from Mm. dinosaurs. (laughs) Yeah, very good. And then we have the Ankylosaurus, which I thought was really good, really uh, epic. I think it was was speaking about how they can retain a lot of water uh, for so long, and they were really well adapted uh, to life in the desert. Nostrils, wasn't there, that they, they. the, the, let the air cool or something. The, the, just, it was described them. as like an air conditioning unit. Yeah. They breathed the air in, and their nostrils cooled the air uh, as it came in through the through the nostrils, which is it's something really good to have when you're in the middle of a desert mm. and it's extremely hot. So they were very well adapted for these badlands. Mm. And um, we see one come across uh, a bit of vegetation and there's a bit of a tussle there kind of fighting for <laughs> it because there's vegetation in the desert is so little and sparse. Yes. Um, it's worth fighting over. And then one comes to a small oasis um, where there's some smaller dinosaurs who... The uh, preface, Cephali again. The, again, the pre... pre um, is that how you said the name? Preno <laughs> Cephali. <laughs> Oh. I'll be able to pronounce it by the end of this, uh, <laughs> the end of this <laughs> session, but um, they are just annoying the Ankylosaurus and you know pestering him because the water's so you know scarce, scarce yeah. that it's worth you know trying to uh, keep to yourself. But that's when the larger Ankylosaurus is hidden away in some little cave. Yeah, and he, he fends them off by you know thrashing his club around, and mm-hmm. then the big male comes out. Yeah. And um, decides to, you know, say clear off. But then the second one comes in. That's a younger one. So there's two young ones and one big male. And he thinks, oh, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna take on two of them. I couldn't believe though, the um, the clubs at the end of the tail weigh twenty kilograms. Yes, <laughs> I think <laughs> that's <laughs> flipping egg. That tail must be incredibly strong to be mm. able to hold up twenty kilograms. I mean, imagine getting hit by that twenty kilograms. Bang. It's enough to break bones, you know, when you think, God, yeah. it's, it's it's impressive. You'd have a bad headache if you, well, you'd probably be dead. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> a bad headache at the least, and dead at yeah. the worst. <laughs> impressive stuff. So they have that little fight, and they decide that they're going to share the water. Uh, and then we move back then to the, sauropod, the sauropods at the start who had laid their eggs. Now these eggs are now hatching mm. in the in the volcanic, uh, like geothermal area that we began the episode in. They're um, hatching, and I think it mentioned something that they were they were making noises from inside the egg to coordinate uh, yeah. that they all hatched at the same time. The hatching, so they all hatch at the same time. Yeah, I think that's really clever because definitely. It, you don't want to hatch too soon and there's no one else around. You want to all hatch at the same time. Strength in numbers. There's, there's, yes, exactly. Strength in numbers. That's what you want. Um, but yeah, they all hatch and then they just they feed off uh, their mother's yes. dung. <laughs> <laughs> nice little I present left for them there. I couldn't believe what I was hearing when uh, David uh, told us that. I thought, oh my God. But it does make sense in a way. You know, mm. all the, the nutrients that the big saur- the adult sauropods have had has been left in their dung and there's nothing else around so yeah. I suppose the baby dinosaurs have no choice but to eat <laughs> the dung <laughs> uh, yeah, no Michelin once... stars being uh, being awarded over here but no. you got to do what you got to do and once they've eaten their, their lovely dung lunch uh, it's then time to move on but 
you may be thinking, how do they move on with all the deadly gases? Um, they were saying there was something about a change in the season there where That's the winds right. have picked up now, and so the gases are blown away, uh, so the gases aren't condensed in such thick areas. But um, because of the gases, gases being moved, this opens the doorway for predators to then come on the scene, and this is the Rajasaur, I believe. Rajasaurus, I think. I really, Rajasaurus or Rajasaur, um, and I really liked this um, this dinosaur. I thought it was really, really cool. Just looked good, the skin, the pattern. Um, and I thought the movement was good. I did notice a few scenes of him running about because he starts to chase the baby sauropods in the, um, like the, the cracks. And because they're so small, they can get away and hide from him. But I thought his movement and the animations was very good with him. Um, and it was quite a scary scene as well because these poor babies were, you know, <laughs> they've been... The babies getting attacked. They've been attacked, again. yes. It's always the babies that get killed in prehistoric planets. Yes, because it, it was described as a feast because he did eat mm. a lot of the babies, yeah. uh, unfortunately. But um, but some did manage to survive. Yes. Some did manage to survive. And what was good as well, just before that hunt as well, they said that the mothers also left them a present, which was... Um, uh, along the journey, the dung had seeds in it, so plants were starting to grow from those seeds, mm -hmm. and they could feed on them on the way just to keep them going before they get to the forest. Uh, but yeah, that that hunt scene was very good. Um, I did like, like you said, the animation of him hopping over the rocks and catching yeah. uh, the the babies. Very very good. Um, but yeah, it was it was uh, uh, what I like as well is that they've come back. To see those, you know, you can you continue with the journey. A lot the episodes of, come full circle, hasn't it? Yeah, there's a lot of scenes that I wish would go on longer. I want to find out what happens next, and with this one, we actually mm -hmm. do. We see those, you know, mothers coming in, laying their eggs, and then we actually see the babies hatching and continuing the journey. What what I'd love to see is just one episode, maybe just on them. You know, seeing those babies growing up and. Yeah becoming sub-adults, having to take on predators and then actually mm. turning into full-on adults and mating and then going back to actually lay their eggs at, at this nest site. Yeah, you know? it'd be nice to see just one dinosaur from start to finish. Yeah, I think that's what, what it could be missing. Um, I know it's basically like planet Earth, you know, showing loads of different clips of different areas of a certain type of habitat. But I do think if we were just to focus on one dinosaur one group and follow their journey through something i think that would be something that uh you know you, you really get to to feel a character from the you bond the with the character of the yeah, dinosaur. yeah so you'd be more. like oh you're following it on this journey you want to see if it survives or not and i don't know i think that's something that they could do if they were going to make another one yes definitely definitely i agree so that is the badlands mm -hmm. so let's move on to swamps Yes, one of my favourite type of habitats. I was looking forward to this. Um, and we open up with a, a lovely scene with uh, some baby uh, pterosaurs yes. that have hatched from their eggs because we know that they had soft-shelled eggs like turtles. So around rivers and stuff like that uh, is a perfect place for them. And even better, they uh, laid their eggs on, a, on an island in the middle of this swamp. So that prevents predators from getting to your eggs and stealing them. Um, so we see these babies hatch, and then they have to take their first flight. Um, yes, yeah, quite a daunting <laughs> experience. Yes, you see the, the 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 river and the opening of the swamp with the water, oh. and it's quite an eerie. I could just tell something was off. <laughs> <laughs> Something's waiting. For Something them in the was water, waiting. So you just knew we, it. we were waiting to fly. And I just had this horrible feeling in the pit of my stomach, <laughs> thinking <laughs> that something was going to happen, and I was right. <laughs> yes, um, because they're obviously not, this is their first flight, they're having to practice. Uh, so some of them aren't very good flyers, and One straight falls away, in the water. falls into the water, and then, bang, this huge crocodile comes up and snatches one from the surface. That's it. I think um, they're called um, Shamosuchus. Shamosuchus. Yeah. Um, so and it's this prehistoric crocodile, crocodile that just, bang, has got the uh, mm. got the baby pterosaur. Again, it's the babies dying. Yeah, the it's always things. the babies. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I thought it was really good how some were, you know, going across, some were making it, some were falling in, and some even were just like, 
just above the surface, and the they were jumping up and actually the um, them, yeah, Shamasukas yeah. jumped up and grabbed them. So it was. Do you know, this reminds me of um, bats. There's a certain crocodile that actually hunts bats. There's these bats that come down. I think they're fishermen bats. They actually f- hunt fish, and crocodiles. These the type of oh, I can't remember what type of crocodile it is but it's the one with the the thin snout thin snout and yes, like a yeah. ball at the end of the yes, nose yes another one you mean uh, and these ones jump up and catch the bats and it reminded me of this uh, very much you know hunting the pterosaurs wow and just at the end when you see that one that's just you think it's got away and you're like oh you know the rest have been eaten but this one has managed to escape and then bang one jumps up knocks it into the water and then mm. it's just trying to get away yeah. and it's building the tension up it's trying to run off and, and the crocodile just, comes out on the land to try it and does, catch yeah. it yeah. and it just manages to, to get away thank god <laughs> <laughs> but no I thought, I thought it was a really good scene a very good opening scene um yeah I rather enjoyed it I did as well I thought it was very good and then we meet this big fish the garfish, yes, um, and it's swimming about, and I was I was just getting interested in it, and I thought, oh, what's this, what's this garfish? And then suddenly, again, bang! Yes. Um, they're good with the jump scares, though. They're very know. good with the jump scares, yeah. yeah. Um, the it was the ostraraptor has just plunged yeah. in and uh, fished this uh, garfish out the water and has eaten it. Yes. And then there's a scene with um, the ostraraptors fishing and it's showing that they're basically fighting for the the best fishing spots yeah yeah um and there's a like a juvenile one isn't it and he's trying to get a good spot and he's on a log at one point trying to reach in um but he's then looking for the scraps essentially um from the the older um old dinosaurs who are quite wasteful with the food yeah because there's so much food going that they eat the best bits and leave the scraps so the uh the less dominant uh, dinosaurs can come in and pick the scraps off that the the, the uh, adults have uh, yeah. you know left. But um, it reminded me of uh, grizzly bears. You know, grizzly bears just all waiting for salmon mm. to come up, and they're all just sat there waiting to catch the food. And also a raptor as well. It's a, a species of raptor that's actually evolved to eating fish. Uh, and I've never heard of this dinosaur, another dinosaur I've never heard of before. Yeah, when you it's say raptor, great. you kind of think of, you know, just the, the vicious meat-eating. Yeah. You don't expect it to be, like, quite evolved to mm. be, you know, Well, you saw fishing. its claw. Its claw didn't look as sharp. It still had a claw that was sticking up on its toe, but it didn't look as curved as a, as a velociraptor's. Mm. And you could see the snout as well of this animal was very pointed. And, and the sharp needle-like teeth. Yeah, to, evolving to, to catch fish. Mm. Um, so you can see their evolution. It's obviously living in a swamp, so it's adapted to live off a diet of fish. So, yeah, it's very good to see another dinosaur as well that's not very you know, very well known or very popular, introducing us to new creatures. Um, that I agree. Exist. I think in the whole season, uh, it's been very good at introducing new ones. There's been... Lows I've never heard of before, yeah. so that's really good. <laughs> and then we meet um, one of the favourite, um, the favourite. Well, it's not even a dinosaur; it's a frog or the oh, devil, yes. the devil toad, <laughs> Beals Buffo. Beals Buffo. And uh, when he came on the screen, I couldn't help but smile. <laughs> when <laughs> I you saw, saw him. his hand, didn't you? you? Saw his hand, yeah. and you could just tell it was that of a frog, and he was like, ah. Here he is. He's come to steal the show. <laughs> yeah, and he he had his own scene this time, mm. uh, which was essentially around him trying to find a mate. Yeah, and uh, I really like the scene where he was he was sat in um, this like this pool, and he begins to do this deep croak yeah. and vibrating uh, in the water. And I thought it was very. Uh, you could just imagine that in real life. Yeah. Uh, that's probably well, you something think how what it would do. That croak would be. It's such a big frog. It would, you know, it would be a very deep croak. You definitely hear like it, the yeah. croaks that you hear off frogs today. Reminded me a bit of a, an alligator, you know, an, all- an alligator's rumbling. It's and just uh, the bubbles back. from its snout. Yeah, everything, and you yeah. just see everything. The water vibrating. The way he just sat there, and that shot where you see the water vibrating around. I thought, oh, mm-hmm. that's a really good shot. That I like that. Yeah. Um, but then he was disturbed. Yes, he was disturbed <laughs> by the sauropods looking yes. for a mud bath. Um, and they start rolling round, and they, well, they almost squash him. So I was yeah. scared that he was going to get squashed because yeah. uh, if one of them sat on him, that'd be um, <laughs> that'd be over for him. <laughs> but I like that how they're actually having a mud bath to cool off and, and possibly protect themselves from the sun. Mm. 
Um, but then there was a very strange scene, and I'm not sure how I feel about this <laughs> clip. Um, the frog doing a forward roll. Yes, he kind of stumbles over and awkwardly flops over. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen a frog do a forward roll. And I remember just looking at you and thinking, what? Why the, why the hell is it doing a forward roll? Why isn't it just hopping like a normal frog? I don't know. Yeah, about it was quite clumsy in its movement in that 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 shot. Mm. I'm not sure if it would if it would be like that. Um, I think it'd be more clever or just like hop. I mean, it's quite a big frog. So if it was going to make if it wants to make quite a bit of a distance, I'm sure it could hop. You know, in, in, a, in a certain way. Unless that's a better way for it to get around. Just roll because it did. Because it did look like quite fat and round. Maybe it just yeah. <laughs> rolled out. There. Maybe it did. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, it it just looked bizarre. And then it went when it the sauropod looked at it, and it just I mean, hissed like back yeah. off. <laughs> but that again, that's very similar to the Majungasaurus and um, the small yeah, herbivorous yeah. Um, um, crocodile uh, mm. relative. It's again an, a smaller animal. Um, you know, taking on a, big taking on a bigger creature, animal, yeah. um, which we do see in real life. So this it's, it's weird, could isn't it? It's, it's like geese. Look at geese. Geese will just they'll hiss at you. It doesn't mm-hmm. matter how big you are. They're like back off, yeah. and you think, okay, <laughs> why yeah, are you yeah. so confident? <laughs> exactly. That's it. Sometimes it's all the confidence and Beals Buffet has got plenty of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it was it was good to see a bit more screen time for him rather than just eating a dinosaur you know actually yes. seeing his life and, and a bit more into uh you know the life of this giant prehistoric frog <laughs> so yeah it was good i like that scene and the next is the pachycephalosaurus um and this is the scene where there's a few of them uh, there's a herd actually so it's a, it's a full mm. herd and it's led by a um a male and one of the younger males is being a bit He's mm. been a bit boisterous, he's a bit rowdy, he's causing problems in the herd, which leads to a standoff between the two um, and, a, and a fight. And they're locking heads, the the butt in there, because they have a huge round crest on the top of the skull. Ten inches thick, I think. It Ten is, yes. inches thick. Which is brilliant for absorbing the impact of hitting each other. Um, it, it made me laugh at the end when they started talking about the scientific information saying oh we found these big heads you know the thick thick skulls they must have butted heads and then they went oh but then later on we changed our mind new evidence came to light they're not actually that um, strong after all and then later on they found dints in the skull and th- said oh yes actually they were butting heads I think sometimes you just have to look at something and just think what's the most common sense for this to be for and it, 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 you know, I think it stands out mild. They're obviously butting heads. You know, why would they have a ten-inch skull? You know, just for there's no point wasting all that time making a skull that thick. You know, it's just a waste of resources if you're not going to actually use it for something. Exactly. It shows how the science is always changing as well. We think mm. we know what what you know the answer is right now, but in the next five, next ten years, you know, yeah. next twenty years. It's always changing, and you know, the science is always new and, f- and fresh. There's fresh discoveries happening every single day, so that's a it's a perfect example of how things, you know, theories change, and there'll be tons of new theories about mm. dinosaurs, you know, that we're talking about now. And we think we know what we're talking about, and then in the next five, ten years, we'll actually be thinking, "Oh my God, I can't believe we thought that." It's actually yeah, this. Yeah. So it'd be interesting to see how much this documentary will actually, you know, you'll look back Stand and think, the test oh, of time. <laughs> that actually isn't correct anymore. In fact, I'd love to see what a, um, a Spinosaurus looks like in 10, 20 years. Well, that's the, that's the <laughs> classic, that's isn't it? That's always changing. Nobody knows. Yeah. But I didn't understand why that, ep- um, that part of the episode was in the Swamp episode. Uh, because they were in like a scrubland, wasn't that? Was it because there was a drought or something? I can't remember. I think but... that's what it was. Yeah, I think it was right. like a, there was a drought in this scrubland. So I think it was a swamp, but it was a different yeah. type I time of the season. As it was happening, I thought this isn't a swamp. Why, is, why are we here? <laughs> What's going on? But uh, no, but it was interesting to see them. You know, the classic headbutting mm-hmm. um, was a, a great scene to watch. You know, battering each other with these <laughs> huge round heads. And then uh, the the younger male actually beats the the elder male at one point, stands yes. there, and thinks I've won, and then 
bang. <laughs> yeah. I thought he'd won at first, and then I thought, oh, they've, they've actually made the younger male win, but then... The older male... The older male pushed him, him over and sends him into exile. Yeah. Um, God. Which... Good luck with that. That's a... a yeah, it's a, a cruel fate, a, you know, a dinosaur going out on his own. You won't last long on your own if you're not with a... If with a larger hunt. predators come and try and get you, you know, you're pretty much... You know, your fate doesn't look good. No, it certainly does not. So Um, this scene was followed by a really good scene. Here we go. So the best scene possibly of the entire... um... I I agree, (laughs) yes, it's definitely a contender. So we're introduced to a herd of Edmontosaurus. They're in, um, you know, like a, a forest area of the swamp. We they're grazing tops walking around I love that scene because it shows the classic you know you see North mm. America with triceratops grazing you know these huge Edmontosauruses and then we see these two Tyrannosaurus Rex yeah. <laughs> just peering at the herd just watching from the oh it's brilliant to see them just, it reminded me of lion just weighing up a herd you know they're, they're, they're watching and thinking is there any weakness here that we can take advantage of um, but they obviously decide to wait. I love how they just stood there. The yeah, because they knew they weren't hunting then, mm. so they were just stood there confidently, weighing, weighing things up. up. Aren't they? That's just it. Things and up. then, like you said, they choose to wait till nightfall, uh, where the the odds are in their favour because it mentions in the in the documentary that their eyes, you know, rival, you know. We know that they rival, you know, modern birds of prey. The very large eyes, the night vision's very, well, very said good. The, la- the largest eyes of any dinosaur. So these are <laughs> these are massive eyes, you know. So they would have let in a lot of light, so they would have been able to see very well at night time. Um, it's you know, it's quite scary to think about. Not only has it got eyes that face forward, so that it's actually got binocular vision and it can actually see, you know. Uh, distance and depth mm. but it can even see in the dark yeah. <laughs> it's very it, this scene actually made t-rex a lot more scarier uh, than you can think of and you know yeah. when you think people say oh accurate dinosaurs aren't scary and you think well in jurassic park if you just stay still the t-rex won't be able to see you you know what i mean in this the t-rex you know a real life tyrannosaurus rex can see you it can see mm-hmm. you clear as day even in the darkness it can see and if it does and if it can't see you it can certainly smell you because it has a fantastic sense of smell as well exactly and i love how both of these t-rexes made a plan yeah they didn't just run in and try and kill the first thing yeah. you saw run in raw i'm here <laughs> you know give away my position it, it was very it was cold it was calculated the, it was coordinated and it was just eerie it was almost like a horror film watching it you know you could yeah. see the t-rex going through the woods yeah. you know and then the other one was going around the other side and they were basically flanking the edmontosaurus mm. and waiting um to, to see one you know who was weak mm-hmm. and then one makes a noise on purpose i thought that was interesting the fact that they actually deliberately made a noise to make them heard nervous that there was prey over here and it takes their attention away from the other Tyrannosaurus Rex that's waiting on mm-hmm. the other side. Now, I thought that was really good. But what, what I found quite hard to believe when they said um, they can walk through the forest almost silently because of cushioned pads on their feet. But I thought, if I try and walk through the forest silently, I think I'd make a noise from all the leaves and the twigs on the floor. So I don't know if it would be... I think it would be know. possibly quiet for a dinosaur, as quiet yeah, as it could be. Maybe. Like you say, you know, these dinosaurs weigh, you know, numerous tons. So mm. how quiet can you be, you know, with each step being a couple of tons, you know, in each step? Yeah. It's, you know, unless they were really, you know, really cushioned pads, but like I say, if the twigs, if there's anything there, yeah. something's going to give. Um, but, you know, as silent as they can be and you know they're clearly good you know hunters and and predators because we can see you know the teeth markings and skeletons and stuff so they clearly were good enough hunters to to grab hold and kill um you know these these animals yeah but it was great that build-up the only thing is uh, if it was just a little bit longer i think you know just build up that tension 
just an extra couple of seconds or you know a, little, a few more minutes just to build it up and then when it pounced out and I thought this was really good as well because the one that made the noise charged out made them all run and the other T-Rex is just waiting in ambush waiting for the prey to come down to it and when that one Edmontosaurus runs over the T-Rex runs out grabs it by the neck and what, what I think was good as well is the Edmontosaurus didn't just go down straight away you know it actually took a, a bit of um, you know it took two of them to bring it down because you think about it an Edmontosaurus is a big if not bigger than a T-Rex yeah, an Edmontosaurus an, is a big animal it's not an easy um, easy prey to take down it's uh, Edmontosaurus are big big animals yeah. as well it's you know could it, it could easily take on a, a T-Rex and defend itself yeah. you know and that's why you know there's there's two T-Rexes clearly mm. you know hunting together I thought that was interesting because you usually think of T-Rex just hunting on its own yeah. you don't think of it hunting in packs but the fact that there was just two of them you know sticking together mm. um, and that may well have happened because like you say these some of these herbivores were really dangerous and would put up an equal fight so mm. maybe going in with two of you you know two T-Rexes it you know puts the the odds back in their favour yeah. you know to be able to catch the prey and actually kill it and eat it I do wonder if it was a male and a female like a mating pair because one of them looked like the the uh, pointy head crest you know the, the bit above the eyes mm -hmm. one looked more um, pointy and larger than the other one so I was thinking is that the male and the other one's the female and in the first one we see the male is actually swimming across with his chicks so it makes you think you know are they, are they interpreting that you know male and female would have both mated and looked after their chicks like you just see with mm -hmm. you know modern day birds or they could um, be potential brothers maybe you know from a, a clutch that have stayed uh, together yeah, yeah possibly um, yeah. I've got to think about it I'm not sure because I know I was looking through the uh, the music track and I'm sure one is called T-Rex Brothers and I'm not sure if that's a bit of a giveaway I, I don't remember hearing it oh what in Prehistoric Planet yeah I'm sure oh. I've seen that that might be I might be completely imagining that but I'm sure in the music track, it's called T-Rex Brothers or something. I'm not sure if it was mentioned oh, in the actual right. episode. Um, I can't remember. But, like I say, either or, um, you know, they're clearly companions. Right. Stuff so they together. could be siblings that are uh, working together from mm. the same clutch. That's, that, yeah, that's an interesting uh, point, yeah. Mm. But, yeah, I, I did love that scene. It, it was, was an great. epic scene. It was good I think to it was see really T-Rex actually hunting because we didn't actually see him hunt in the, um, the first season. So this is one thing that, that you know... We were craving, we were craving yeah. a T Rex hunt, you know, and I think just the tension, the build up, and I think it was executed very well. I thought it was, yeah. it was good, and like we were mentioning before, with the the lack of violence, I think it was, it was just enough. The I think yeah. we didn't really go, you know, all guns blazing with the violence, but I think it was just enough um, for the scene to be executed very well, yeah. and um, I thought it was, I thought it was very, very good. Yeah, it was. <laughs> so it was that fantastic is the swamp. So, like you said, one of the. Um, one of the, probably my favourite episodes as well. So let's move on to episode four, which is Oceans. So we begin this episode with a beautiful shot of a giant mosasaur swimming past the camera. And this really gives you a, a sense of how enormous this animal really is. Yes, I think it was 50 feet long, yes. if I remember rightly. But then it goes on to tell us that not, not all mosasaurs are this big, and there are other species, such as this one, which is a smaller uh, mosasaur. And um, we see him going up to take a breath from the surface, because um, they, obviously, are, um, they all breathe oxygen. Yes, yes, they so have they to breathe air. The they don't have gills like a fish. Exactly. Uh, and I thought it was good, this, because uh, it, it's showing that not all mosasaurs are massive giants. Uh, there are some that, because uh, there's many different species of mosasaur, and I think it's good to also focus on the, you know, the not so well known ones and bring those into the light. Uh, but yeah, she had to jump up for a breath and make sure that, uh, you know, she had to dart up there quickly because the big one would have uh, probably attacked her or hunted her if, if it had the chance. That's right. So she's hiding in um, the like the rocks for most of the day and she waits till night time where she then starts to hunt. And she's hunting these uh, cool fish called lanternfish that yes. create uh, these lights and a bit of a mirage under the water that makes them... It's essentially the 
uh, they're at the surface of the water and it helps them blend in with the moonlight mm -hmm. um, but as David tells us um, the Phosphorosaurus which is this smaller Mosasaur um, isn't affected and can see through this uh, it said a uh had the largest eyes, didn't she, of, the, of, of any Mosasaur, I think? For any Mosasaur of her size. So for her size, oh, right, so see. in proportion yeah. to her body, she, they have the largest right. eyes. So that um, shows she probably was hunting at night. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So it shows that they're adapted to be hunting at night. And, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, and the lanternfish are on the menu. And the next scene we have, we have a, a shoal of fish being hunted by... a. Uh, a group of Hesperonis, which is a type of bird um, that is flightless and uh, is swimming around, a bit like a penguin, but but uh, not as torpedo shaped. It's got a much more longer, slender neck. Um, and these animals are flightless and they swim around. You may remember them on uh, Swimming with Sea Monsters with Nigel yes. Marvin, uh, when he looks into the, uh, <laughs> into the water with the... Um, what is it, the, 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 the underwater, underwater camera, and camera. he's looking through it, and he sees, oh, it's a bloodbath, and you see one of the Hesperonis um, getting eaten by one of these fish. I think it's the same type of fish. Uh, yes, this X fish. The X fish. It's got a very, I think it's the Zip Actinus, Zip Actinus, or Zip Actinus, but it's called an X fish. Um, it's with an X, but it's pronounced with like a Z. Um, oh, right, but okay. these fish basically eat anything, don't they? Yeah, they'll um, even eat their own kind, it said, didn't they? That's right, yes. and that's what we see later on in this episode. We see um, them come for the fish, then the attack of the Esperonis, um, mm. eat one of them, and then, just for good measure, they decide to eat one of their own kind as well. <laughs> well, <laughs> so. they're eating the fish at first, and then they said as the fish start to go down in number... They start uh, viewing the Hesperonis as food, don't they? And then when the Hesperonis mm. clear off, they're like, oh, we'll eat each other. <laughs> we'll eat the smaller ones of our own kind. Uh, but that fish, it looks like a, a bulldog, doesn't it? It's got a really weird jaw. Um, yeah, you certainly wouldn't want to um, yeah, get it's a in the monster water you with that. You wouldn't want to uh, be swimming in the water with them. They're um, really horrible, gruesome yeah, how, fish. How, were they nine, was it nine feet long? Or? I think they were um, seventeen feet long. Oh, flipping it! Um, wow, and they're very fast. They're one of the, God, one of the fastest so they're, they're fish very, alive. They're, they're very big fish. You wouldn't want to. Uh, yeah, you wouldn't want to be in the water with one of those. Definitely you not. Certainly wouldn't. <laughs> flipping heck. So that's that. Uh, the fish basically eat everything, um, and then the next scene is the um, the ammonite eggs. Um, that are being uh, yes. Um, they're basically being washed out to. They're in the rock pools and they're being washed out. Some have been washed out to the ocean, uh, mm -hmm. but some um, get stuck as the tide goes out and they get stuck in the rock pools. And when it dries up, we then see these scavengers come in um, and start yes. nibbling away and and eating eating these ammonites that have not made it out to sea. Yeah, they kind of just get drifted all over the place, don't they? The currents take them off, the tide brings them in. They're just washed all over the place, these little eggs. They're a little bit uh, helpless in a way, but there was a bit where uh, the rock pools were starting to get dried out and they all came together as like one big force and started just using their tentacles to crawl. Mm. Um, they became like one whole... Being organism, yes, uh, one was, organism, yeah, yeah. multiple organisms become one to get over to the, crawl into the next uh, yeah, rock, rock pool. pool, yes. But I must say, there was some very, very bizarre ammonites. Yes, there's one shaped like a paperclip, <laughs> which is very strange. I've never seen or heard of that in my life. Yes, it's very, very bizarre how an animal can evolve to take that form and, and they were all bizarre there was some that was just there was dead long ones wasn't there i mean they mm. weren't the the bizarrest they're a bit like uh reminded me a bit of author cones um, yes and then there was um there was one and it, it's the way it spiraled it spiraled round and then its body came out to its shell so I thought, how is it gonna yeah, eat because yeah. it's its tentacles are like almost coming back on itself so it's just, I don't know, they're very, very, very weird animals. creatures. Um, and what, they said it was, they were very successful, though, didn't they? They said they, they'd last in the, yeah. in the oceans for millions so many millions, millions, millions yeah. of years. So they, they did very well as a species. Yeah, you know? definitely. Yeah. It's, very, <laughs> it's just a very bizarre scene, though. Yeah. 
The next yeah. scene. So this is with the uh, elasmosaurs. Uh, the I think yes. it's the tyrannosaurs. Yes, yes. yes. Pronouncing that right. The tyrannosaurs. Um, a type of elasm- elasmosaur. Uh, and this is where um, they are. They're in the shallows. They're spending their time. They're quite safe in the shallows, but they have to go out and hunt mm-hmm. into deeper water. Um, and with deeper water comes predators. Yes, and then we see the mosasaur. Again, now this is the big one that we saw at the beginning of the episode. Yes. And, uh, which is 50 foot long, really big and bulky. Um, and he is hid behind a rock watching them doing the, their fishing. Um, mm. And it talks about, um, it's like a, I think it's in the end section of the episode around the science, but you see the Mosasaur almost lie on the floor of the of the ocean uh, and put his tail um on the on the floor and go into like a C shape, yes. and they use this to propel themselves upwards, uh, to basically pushing off the floor of the ocean to make them go faster. And they see that with fish um, today, so they've got that from animals today. So it's very likely that they may have well yeah, done yeah. the same thing. Yeah, I thought thing. that was interesting. That I didn't realise that fish did that. When they slowed down a fish, you see that before it actually, um, you know, propelled itself off. Because it made a quick dart, didn't it? But in mm. slow motion, you actually see the it bends its body, getting it in that position, so then it can basically spring itself. It's like a big spring, really. When you think of a spring, when you put pressure on it, it, that pressure releases. So it's getting itself into this coiled position, and then just with one flick of its tail, bang! It it, it just releases all this power. That's right. And we see it go for the um, the elasmosaur mm. um, on the first attempt. It doesn't manage to get one. Yes. Um, but I think that's good because most hunts in nature today end in failure, so that makes uh, a lot of sense to do that. Exactly. So the second time round, we see the kind of very similar setup. The uh, elasmosaurs are fishing, and the mosasaur again gets itself into this coiled um, position, and then we flip to the <laughs> surface of the water, and suddenly... Bang! That, the, was, that was probably my favourite shot out of this episode. The elasmosaur comes flying out the water inside the jaws of the mosasaur yes. and crash back into the ocean. Uh, it's a really epic um, scene. It reminded really me good. of uh, great whites jumping out, yes. getting seals, but it, I thought it was just going to jump like, you know, halfway out maybe, but it, its whole body came out and it completely flipped over and its head came back in first. So yeah. It just shows you the immense power of this. And I, I thought to myself, would this animal really be able to get its whole body out? But later on when they said um, the power that it could use from that coiled position, mm, yeah. it, it even said the force itself would kill the prey. Not even the bite, just the force of getting yeah. hit by that just the Power. impact alone would That's kill them. incredible when you think about it. I mean, it'd be like getting hit by a truck, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it would. It'd be like a train. Bang! <laughs> you know, just completely take you out. But no, it was, it, that was a really good scene. I really enjoyed that. Um, I mean, Mosasaurus is just such a cool animal. I really, really enjoy seeing it on the screen. And this big one as well. Um, what was it called? The Mosasaur Hoff, Hoffman's Mosasaur or something, I think it was called. I'm not too uh, sure. Actually. Which what, is the, is la- that it's the largest, is that the largest one? one. Now, I always thought, oh, Tylosaurus was the largest one. But this one must be a new discovery that now has mm-hmm. overtaken this one in size. Um, but, yeah, it's absolutely massive. And not only has it got... Um, you know the force of being hit, and then the jaws. But on the on the top of the jaw, so they have a row of teeth, obviously on the outside, and and then at the back of the the roof of the mouth, there's another set of teeth, which actually grab the prey and help it bring the the prey into the mouth and swallowed. It's just what well, I mean. What a predator! I mean, and you know this thing has evolved from lizards. When you think of like Komodo dragons and things like that. It makes That's you wonder how such from. a successful creature ended up going extinct I know, in, this, I in the ocean. That, I mean, I think the only thing that I can think of is maybe because it was so large, it didn't have many animals to feed off when when the, the comet hit. You know, everything, all the large creatures went, didn't they? It was only the small ones that survived. Um, but the only reptile to survive the comet was the turtles, the only sea reptile. Mm. And it's It's crazy like you know I mean, imagine if mosasaurs had managed to cling on and we still had them today yeah it's strange that though because a mosasaur hunted turtles 
as well. Um, and that's and the turtle survived. You'd thought if the turtles were still about, you'd think the mosasaur was still alive. I don't know what exactly it was that um, must have. I don't know. And the tipping point for them. But. but imagine if they were. I mean, do you know what though? It would be even more dangerous having those around than sharks, I believe, because mm. a shark has to keep moving. So a shark, a you've, got, you've got more chance of noticing it, and a mosasaur, it could take it one massive breath and then just sit at the bottom and just chill there and just wait. And you imagine that, you're, you're, <laughs> you're snorkeling, looking at all the lovely, beautiful fish, and then you just see this giant lizard's head just staring at you, and you're thinking... Oh my god! <laughs> and that would be the last thing you'd ever see, <laughs> and then you'd be taken out. Oh god! Oh, you it might not be... even see it. Yeah, you might not. You might just. Oh, you might be a quick bang. <laughs> what happened? Yeah. You definitely would uh, think twice about swimming in the sea yes. on your holidays if they were about still. Yeah. But no, I really enjoyed that scene. It was it was a brilliant. Uh, yeah, so brilliant. Did I. So the last scene of the episode is a strange uh, aquatic animal. It's um. Another elasmo saw. Yeah, another um, please you saw, yes. And I think it's called a, a Mortinura, if I'm pronouncing that right. And these are these uh, warm blooded, uh, they almost remind me of seals. Yeah, um, yeah, they they've do. They've got this thick blubber on them um, to keep them warm. And they've migrated down from South America uh, down to Antarctica, the ice, uh, for food. Yes. And that food is strangely um, it's embedded in the dirt. Under the ice, yeah. at the bottom of the ocean Layers floor. of mud, isn't it? So That's they, right. They and scoop up the the mud in their mouth and just filter out the uh, the mud and the micro. There's loads of microbes in the living inside the soil, and they filter those uh, filter out the mud and then eat the the microbes. That's it. And it's quite cool with these. They say they they tilt their jaw on a certain angle and it turns their mouth into like a sieve, and they yes. drag this through the water, which basically filters out the mud and actually gathers the actual food that they're after. And mm-hmm. they said that these are one of the only animals that have evolved a mouth to feed in this way. Yeah, it's a really bizarre animal. And I wonder if they would have maybe crawled out on the ice like uh, s- seals do today. You Potentially, know? if there's predators that were down there with them, I imagine they would use it as refuge, maybe. Yes. Uh, it'd be interesting to see... If there were, you know, maybe a predator scene down there, yeah. um, it would have been quite cool. It was quite a relaxed scene. Um, it's a nice little peaceful way to finish off the episode. Yes. Right, I, I have thought that, though, in the past. I've thought, you know, they have flippers, these uh, plesiosaurs. I wonder if they may have crawled out onto the land, you know, because, you know, uh, turtles still that, do that today. Uh, they lay their eggs in the sand and I always thought oh they, they come up and, and lay their eggs on the beach just like turtles do but actually they say that they uh, they give birth to, to live young um, yes yeah, so that they've completely adapted to life in the sea but I wonder if those flippers will be powerful enough to uh, actually crawl them out onto the ice maybe have a have a chill on the ice you know to escape from predators or something like that you know if a predator comes it might crawl out to get away I think that might be a possibility mm-hmm. Yes. Well, on to the final episode. Ooh, yes. Let's get stuck into it. Ooh. So, the final episode of Prehistoric Planet. What Two. an episode. <laughs> Two, yes. Um, what an episode this was. We begin the episode with North America's largest land animal at the time, which, of course, is the Alamosaurus. Um and it was great to see this animal reconstructed. It looked absolutely fantastic. Very uh, thick and chunky, lots of meat on them. Not You know, they weren't shrink-wrapped at all. They didn't have long, spindly necks. Very uh, meaty, lots of hide. They actually looked like real animals. You know, when you see a skeleton of one of these animals, it's, it's you think, wow, it's big. But then when you actually put the meat and the muscle and all the hide and the thick skin, you think, wow, what an absolute beast. Um, and there was one uh, individual which was a male, and they said that the, you know he reached a great age. I think he said 70 years of age he was. Mm. And they said he was probably the father of many of these individuals in this herd. So he's passed down his genes, but he's come to the end of his life, very sadly. Um, but yeah. he's obviously overnight he passes away, but his body isn't... Um, mm. you know, put to waste. It's a circle of life, 
as they say, and then these little raptors come in to try and start eating away. But unfortunately for them, they can't get through his thick hide. Yes, and you see this in Africa with with uh, some carcasses like hippos and uh, rhinos or elephants. If they've died, their, their hide is so thick that many predators are, are waiting for something with a, enough power from their jaws to actually tear the hide open. And I think it's only um, hyenas and lions maybe leopards I think that actually have the power to rip open the carcass uh, and of course we all know what animal uh, on the land had the largest um, bite force bite fo the most powerful bite force should we say um, and that of course goes to the Tyrannosaurus Rex and a Tyrannosaur actually... has smelt out the carcass from many miles away and come to investigate on the uh, Alamosaurus, the dead Alamosaurus carcass. And he actually chases off the raptors as well. He, he, he does. Comes in fact, in he goes go for one. Yeah. <laughs> He's <laughs> he probably thinking, one. I'd rather have some fresh meat rather than this uh, this dead meat here. I'd rather have something that's alive. Uh, but they're too fast for him, uh, yeah. so they run off. And the T-Rex tucks in to the, the carcass. He does, and there's a little bit that does go to the raptor. There's a little bit of scraps that he does manage to get. Yes. Um, but sooner or later, we have from the skies, quite mm. quite less arrive. Well, it was only a matter of time before another predator uh, turned up. When you've got something that big, the smell, and also quite quite less there in the air, they'll be looking down. You know, they, they'll have a bird's eye view of the landscape, and they've obviously seen this huge titanosaur dead on the beach, and thought. I'll try my luck with this. Exactly, um, and he said it said that it's one of the few predators that predators that actually, you know, go against T Rex. Mm. Um, it shows the confidence that it has to even just go up yeah. to it and try and challenge it. And at first, T Rex doesn't really take it seriously, but then the odds change when a second one arrives. Yeah, I think the first one was just trying its luck. He thought, I'm just going to sit here and just see if you know, see what the T Rex will do. And the T Rex just goes, Ah, oh, you know. It's only one, I'm not bothered, I'm not even gonna be gonna give you the time of day. But then obviously as you said the second one turns up, now the odds have changed. And at first I was a little bit thinking, really? Could could this animal really take on a T Rex? But then you see as the T Rex actually goes forward, one of them looks really nervous. You can see him like jumping back into his like, oh, you know, definitely scared. They don't want to get bit by this creature. But when they take to the air, the odds change. Um now think about it you know a t-rex you might think surely not a t-rex would beat these animals in a fight but there's two of them and that bill that beak is how long was it i'm sure it was two meters or something like that something this like huge that. javelin long. you've got to think as a t-rex in that position is it really worth the risk of getting injured if one wrong swipe, like it said, it could cost it an eye, you know, if it pokes it in the wrong place. But also even just a, a poke in the back, which it actually does, it poke prods the Tyrannosaur in the back, that could get infected or something like that. So you think, is it worth standing here and just, you know, the T-Rex doesn't have an ego like it does in Jurassic Park, thinking, I must fight to the death. It's thinking, no, I'll leave this, That's I'll come it. back it later. It cuts its losses, doesn't it, and think, you know what, I'll let you have your fill, and I'll just come back later because them yeah. two Quetzalcoatlus aren't going to eat all of that sauropod. They're going to eat not. as much as they can, and then they'll fly away, and the T Rex can come back, eat the food that he needs, mm -hmm. and he's not wrist injury, he's not been injured, he's not died. Yes, I think it was good this though because it's showing realism of what would really happen in the natural world. And I know a lot of people might be upset about this, thinking, "Well, what? the T Rex would win in a fight," but. I mean, if you look at uh, modern day animals today, you'll see that um, I've seen footage of polar bears uh, going on tops of cliffs trying to eat uh, birds' eggs. And the birds are flying down, pecking at the birds, you know, stabbing them with their beaks. And the, the, the bear gets so fed up with being pecked, he just thinks, oh, you know, I'll, I'll leave it. I'll yeah. leave it. You know, I'm not dealing with the hassle. And I think it's happened with grizzly bears as well, I'm sure birds have just been flying down just pecking predators that are so much bigger than them but they've obviously got that advantage of the flight you know they, they if, if t-rex tries to lunge for them you know it, it's very hard to maneuver and take on a on a yeah, predator yeah. that's in the sky you know they can come to the ground and meet the t-rex on the ground but the t-rex can't take to the skies and meet them in the skies yes. 
So I thought it was a very interesting scene. I thought one yeah. we were all looking forward to, and I think it, it didn't disappoint. No, I mean, I remember seeing that in the trailer, and I thought, surely not. I quite, quite love staying on a T-Rex. But now that I've watched the scene and I've seen the clip, it does make complete sense. It, you know, why risk injury? Why risk losing an eye over this meal? You know, you may as well just uh, back down and come back later. And it shows the intelligence of the T-Rex kind of as well. It made a yeah, logical yeah. choice and he's lived to fight another day. Exactly, yes. It's survival of the wisest as well, you know, not just the fighting. You know, he could have he could have carried on fighting there. Imagine if he'd lost an eye. He wouldn't have been able to hunt as well in the future. You know, imagine if he got an infection or something like that. It's just not worth the risk for the Tyrannosaur. Well, there we have it. That's, that's the first opening scene. Yeah, a brilliant way to open up the, the last uh, episode. Fantastic uh, start, wasn't it? It certainly was. And the second scene is another Mosasaurus. Yes. And this is back in the sea. And um, it's hunting the Ammonites again, mm-hmm. um, which was really interesting to see because it was hunting them, but it wasn't just eating them straight away. It was no. grabbing hold of them. And it was cracking the shells to basically deflate them because it released the oxygen yeah. out of the shells, which keep the ammonites, you know, floating able to move. Keeps them the buoyant, water. doesn't it? So it, it, they sink down to the bottom when it bites one of them. That's yeah. it. And it, it wouldn't stop and eat the one that it caught. It would just keep going around and bite as many as it could mm-hmm. to disable as many. And then later, it would then come back and all the go to the ocean floor. And then start eating all the ones very, that are disabled. Very clever, I must say. This this reminds me very much of a fox. If a fox breaks into a, a hen house, it will kill all the chickens, mm. and it will grab as many as it can in its mouth, and then run off with them. And you see this as well uh, with um, Arctic foxes. Um, if you've ever seen birds that nest on the cliffs as their the baby birds are flying out for their first ever test flight to the ocean, some obviously don't make it they land on the on the um, on the land instead of in the ocean and the fox will come over and it will just grab as many as it can in its bill it won't just be happy with one it thinks I'll grab as many as I can run off back to the babies and it runs back again and it's collecting them because it, it makes sense rather than just have one and then you tuck into this snack and all your prey is then left you might as well kill as many as you can and then you can just gorge on them mm-hmm. later on. Yeah, again, again showing the intelligence of these dinosaurs, yeah. Mm, yeah so I thought very, well, very that good. was um, very good. I must say, I really enjoyed, it's only a small shot, but the shot where the Mosasaur sticks its tongue out. <laughs> I thought this was really good because yeah. it reminds us that they're related to the lizards yes. because we see that it's a, a forked tongue. And what's interesting about this as well is that... Um, Snakes do this today, and lizards. Uh, they taste with their tongue. They taste the air, and you, almost like a smell as well. Um, and what this is is the the reason it's a forked tongue is because whichever one has picks up the strongest scent can lead them in a, that direction. So if they're getting more of a taste on this side, on the left, mm. their prey is more likely to be on that side. So it leads them in that in that direction. And obviously, in water, it's going to be able to taste. You know, it's prey a little bit uh, better in the water. Through the liquid, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I thought that was a really nice touch, that, having a, you know, seeing him stick his tongue out. That's it, I like it. Yeah, it was very good. And next we're on to the, um, the raptors, um, the little, um, the white, fluffy baby ones with the father, uh, yes. who are at a little, um, like a lake, and there are tons, thousands, millions of... Of flies yes. that have um, hatched <laughs> uh, from the lake. I think all the um, the larvae had um, you know hatched and they were there and they were there for the um, there was stuff in the water as well, wasn't there that they were feeding on? Uh, if I remember rightly, I think there was toxins or something in the water. That was too much salt or something like that, and the flies could um, basically get rid of this. They had a better way of getting rid of the toxins in the water, mm-hmm. um, and then the babies were feeding off the flies again this is really good it's, it's realistic rather than showing dinosaurs just you know hunting big prey and stuff like that it's showing you know some would have just eaten things like insects yeah and things like that especially babies you know they're down at the bottom of the pecking order they've got to work their way up to to bigger prey and they talk about how these raptors are quite an intelligent 
um, species. And the you see the babies, some are just like napping away in the air, and then some figure out that actually it's more intelligent to just run with, with your, your mouth, mouth open, open. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and gather as many flies as yeah, possible. It's just like a swallow, swallows do that. They just fly with the mouth open and mm. just fly into a swarm of flies uh, to, to grab as many that land in the mouth. Exactly. Yeah. But then we do have the, the father who's got his eyes on bigger prey, yes. uh, which are these um, these birds. They remind me of flamingos um, I thought that, in yeah. the middle of the lake, yeah. and um, he's creeping up well, on they, them. They were um, very early forms of ducks, weren't they? I think they were, like very early forms. That would make sense. They did look like a goose, I thought. They, looked they had like, like a geese. duck bill. It was like a half a duck, half a flamingo. Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I agree. And um, he manages to grab one of these. He runs up yeah. and grabs one, um, and he brings that back to the to the babies yeah. to give them more more substantial meal. I like that as well. It was very um, good the shot how they got that hunt scene in how he was stalking it for quite a while, mm. and then as he jump went to grab it, they flew off, and he jumps up and grabs it. Yes, grabs brings it, on the it leg. down. Really good shot. Yeah, really, really good. It was good. I enjoyed that as well. Uh, but the next scene is uh, one that was seen in the trailer and I was looking forward to as well, um, which is the classic Triceratops. Oh, yes. The Triceratops <laughs> um, are in the forest yes. and um, they're all together for the, um, well, it's basically the um, the breeding season, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And they're competing for mates. The females are here to, to pick a male and the males are here to, to show off and fight off all the rivals mm-hmm. to compete for a female. Uh, and here, this is where we meet a, a young male. Um, his horns are nice and fancy. They're um, they're big. They're you know, but they're untouched. That uh, David tells us, isn't he? Basically, um, he's not got much experience in fighting. Um, however, the next Triceratops that turns up, he does. Yes, we see this huge bull Triceratops. I think he said he weighs 10 tons and he's absolutely enormous he was and 30 years old as well yes 30 years old and he had these enormous horns absolutely huge and when, when he first walked big. out i was like i didn't know they grew that big but when you think about it you know the fossils that we found of um triceratops there would obviously be freaks of nature you know where you look, look at it with elephants today you see some elephants you look at them on average, they've got a few big tusks, and then you always find that massive bull that's just got these enormous tusks. And with him being 30 years of age as well, you think at uh, the time these horns have had to grow, because what you have is you have the bone, and then over the top of the bone you have keratin. So this keratin has just been growing and growing and growing and growing. all Every year it's been growing a bit more, and now he has these enormous horns. And uh, he mentions... David, that you know, these have got a bit of wear and tear on them, um, which the female finds uh, impressive. It shows his experience, it shows his experience, and he's you know, he's been around the block a bit. Whereas this young male, his lovely, nice horns look very beautiful, but it doesn't look like he's got much experience. But still, the younger male does take on uh, this. Well, that's <laughs> this, it, he gets this some experience uh, in this fight, doesn't he? Because yes. they have a standoff. And they, they have that run up with you run up and you hear that clatter and it just thuds and you hear that you know the noise is incredible and then they're locked horns and they're pushing and shoving um, and there's a shot and like an aerial shot from above and you can see the the size comparison really from yeah. each side and the the old male is just you can see he's like hind legs and his his back is just built like <laughs> like a brick wall like a tank that's it <laughs> and um, he does get the better of the um, of the younger male and he and he throws him to the ground and in the process he also snaps some of yeah, the younger male's horn off. horn off doesn't he yes um, and you can see the the blood you know, it's quite um, the blood coming out of it and the, the bit of a, yeah. like the the injury um, but. As it was said in the um, the episode, this is now next time round when he comes to breed, he's got some wear and tear, and you know females will then look at him and say, "Oh, and actually, a bit more experience as well." You've you yeah. fought, so next time you might come round and actually beat you know the rival um, yeah. and be su- successful in the breeding. I mean, imagine witnessing this. I mean, if you watch stag today or moose, you know, fighting with their antlers, and then you think, just scale that up 
to this. I mean, you could see it, when they were digging their, their feet into the ground, and you could see the dust kicking up and mm. the power there. Imagine the power. It's, oh, it's just incredible. It's immense. It's, it's mad. <laughs> it's nature just on, on steroids, isn't yeah. it? You know, when you think of animals today, you know, scaling up to that, oh, it would have been uh, quite something to witness in real life. It would be amazing. It certainly would. Well, we're on the, to the final scene. Oh my goodness! The final really? scene of the um, wow. the last episode and the season. So this is um, the Nanukasaurus. Yes. Um, and it's watching um, these. Um, I think oh, I'm not quite sure the the dinosaurs. Like I think. is it? Yeah. Yes, yes. And the, another, they're yeah. like feathered, and they're like a snowy environment. Mm-hmm. And um, it says this Nanukasaurus is very hungry. Um, now these are very fast. Dinosaurs, um, but the herbivores—they're yeah, like ostriches, aren't they? They can just leg it. That's it, yeah. Um, so basically, because they're faster than the nucasaurs, he basically says his aim is to cause panic, and he yeah. runs in and just causes absolute chaos. And hopefully, one running. will get split off or something. Yeah, that's it. And um, with the first attempt, he doesn't get near one, um, yeah. and they escape. Um, but then. He comes at another angle, I think, doesn't he? Or he comes from a bit more. I think he he, he runs at them again. I think it's just it's just a case of just keep trying until you succeed. And uh, one one gets split up from the group because I think he was close to grabbing one, and he actually goes to bite, and you see him just miss, and that one then turns around, doesn't it, and yes, runs away yeah. in the other direction, and the rest of the group run off the other way. Now, being on your own, now you're vulnerable. Where are you going to run? You know. Yeah. And uh, then she and slips, doesn't she, on the ice? She does, yeah, she slips. And that just gives the Nanukasaurus uh, uh, the edge, essentially, yeah. uh, to get in it. And then the, she does grab hold and kill, kill her, unfortunately. Yes. But, um, I, I did love this scene, though. It reminded me very, very much that these, these shots, because we see these animals in the, in the, um, in the first season of um, yes. Prehistoric Planet. Um, and they do remind me of wolves. I think that's where they've got their inspiration here, because we see the first one where they're, where they're hunting, um, they're all teaming up together to hunt a pachyrhinosaur. Yes. That reminds me of wolves hunting bison. Now, this reminded me of wolves hunting something like a hare. Um, I remember watching a pack of wolves on, on, I think it was on Planet Earth, or one, one of those mm. that David is uh, narrating, and yes, you see the wolf yeah. going after this hare, and the hare is running all over the place. They actually nearly grab it. You see the the fluff in the mouth it actually rips off a chunk of hair and you think the hair is going to get away and eventually they do get it but this reminds me it's just the aerial shots as well that do it for me you know you're looking up from above as if you're in like a drone or a helicopter and it, it's that shot that makes it just give it that realism you know you, it, was a, it was a beautiful scene to watch a really good hunt um, and that's what I think we all really wanted from the first um, episode we didn't get to see too many hunts you know but in this one i think they really did make up for it we got plenty of hunts and yeah. this one i have to say it's up there with one of the best hunts that i've seen really really good i agree and it's interesting to see them hunting alone uh, rather than in season one they yes. were a big pack but i think the return the anathemimus to uh, babies and they start eating that and it just mentioned that once they've grown up they'll start they will start helping the mother with the hunts. So, oh, did, is that what they said? I can't yeah, yeah. So they'll, oh, right. when they get old enough, they'll start coordinating the hunts maybe more. That's interesting. Uh, like we saw yeah. in uh, season one. Um, when then they'll be enough. able to tackle bigger prey such as Pachyrhinosaur. That's it, yeah. Yes, that's, that makes uh, a lot of sense. I think, that, I think it's really good, though. It's shown a variety as well because some dinosaurs, we don't know if they did hunt in packs uh, or whether they hunted alone. So it's showing, you know, maybe sometimes they would group into gangs I don't know if they would have actually been in a social group maybe they would have been but uh, if you look at Komodo dragons you know they hunt together sometimes they'll all gang up and, and hunt something mm-hmm. and they're not actually in a pack you know they just kind of all go oh right come on then we're going to hunt let's let's just do it you know and they all just decide to start yeah. hunting together so it's they've all got the same goal so the yeah kind of yeah together so at the time, it, it could be something like that or it could be that they are actually in social groups i think it to be honest i think they probably could have formed social groups they're pretty intelligent creatures i think um i think they probably would have been hunting in packs a lot of them yeah um i agree i think yeah. that'd, that'd, be, that'd be the case and interesting as well to see that the tyrannosaurus when that hunt happened you know there was two there 
You know, when you exactly, think of yeah. T-Rex hunting in Pat, I mean, as if they're not scary enough, you've got two Tyrannosaurs hunting, like, wow, God, that would have been uh, <laughs> something to witness. Well, there we have it. That is all five episodes. Yes. Now, this is where the difficult question comes. Oh, God. <laughs> Which one is your favourite episode and why? Well, um... Do you want to go first, or should I? <laughs> you go ahead. Uh, you go, I'll, uh, I'll have a think. Um, okay. Well, I'm probably going to say that I think the best one was the last one, just because of the the amount of action that we got in it. Uh, this hunt was very, very good. So it's North America for you. I think so. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed the hunt. I enjoyed uh, of the the Nanooksaw with the the Ornithomimus. I did love seeing Tyrannosaurus Rex. Uh, scavenging on the um, the carcass of the Alamosaurus. Uh, just getting to see Alamosaurus as well was brilliant. Um, and also seeing the Quetzalcoatlus take on the Tyrannosaur, I thought that was a really, really good scene. Um, and also seeing the Mosasaur as well, the Mosasaur was hunting as well. So, and, and of course, the Triceratops. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that, does it? You know, th- this classic thing that we know that they did and we see them going head to head, you know, uh, fighting for the right to mate. I think there's just so many good clips in this scene uh, that really made it stand out for me. So I'm going to I'm gonna put this one at the top. Um, I- I'm fighting between that one and the Swamps episode because uh, obviously the Tyrannosaurus hunting <laughs> the Edmontosaurus is such a good scene. And I would say that's probably what, in fact, that might be my favourite scene. But the reason I'm going to pick uh, North America is just because there's so many good clips in this that this overall, one, overall, yeah. it has uh, it gets a top spot for me. So, what about you? What do you think? <laughs> well, I was quite similar. I was stuck between, I was stuck between three: North America, swamps, and I also liked oceans just for the fact of the. Uh, mm. Um, that scene with uh, the Mosasaur jumping out yeah. um, with the Elasmosaur, I really enjoyed the the science behind that with the you know the sea um, shape pressing off the the floor of the ocean. Yeah. Uh, I do love the Mosasaur, um, but if I had to narrow it down, it's got to be swamps. For swamps, me. it's oh, got right. to be swamps. Okay. Um, I just love that scene with the T Rex. Um, those two T Rex working together. Um, against the Edmontosaurus, mm-hmm. um, really enjoyed that, and then I, I enjoyed the Beez, uh, Beals before. That was, oh yeah, that, that was good. <laughs> I enjoyed that, uh, and then I loved seeing the crocodiles at the beginning as well. Um, the mm. Shamosuchus, I believe it was called, yes. uh, hunting the um, the pterosaurs flying over the water. I thought that was a really good scene because, as you mentioned. It's very similar to the crocodiles hunting the bats today. So that yeah. felt really, very real for me. Mm. Um, so I would have to say swamps. Swamps is your favourite. So wow. we've got swamps and North America. So, guys listening, put down in the comments what your favourite episode was and why. Let us know. And let us know your favourite scene as well. Mm-hmm. So let's rank the episodes then. I think we can put North America as top. That's your favourite episode. Yes, as difficult as a decision this is, uh, yeah, I think uh, North America at the top. It's just got three very strong scenes for me. The Triceratops fighting, uh, the Nunuksaurus uh, hunt at the end, and uh, the beginning of the episode where we have the, the Quets versus the Tyrannosaurus. I think they're just three very strong scenes that put it at the top for me. Definitely. So my favourite was Swamps, so I think, should we say second place for Swamps? Yes, uh, the one with the Tyrannosaur Hunt, I think that can get a nice second place. I agree, the Crocodiles, you've got Beals before, and you've got the classic T-Rex Hunt with Edmontosaurus Mm. at the end. So that leaves, um, we've got the Islands, Badlands and Oceans, so what what are we thinking for them? I'm going to say the Badlands just because of that Velociraptor hunt yes. where he karate kicks the Prenocephaly off the, the cliff. cliff. I think uh, I think that deserves third place just from that alone. <laughs> so Badlands has third place, so that leaves Oceans and Islands to battle it out now for fourth and fifth place. I'm gonna say I'm gonna say Oceans, you know. I would have said the same as well. Oceans I think for fourth. the Mosasaur hunt, which is where it smashes out the water with the Elasmosaur is just it's too good of a scene to put at the bottom. That just uh, gives it the edge, doesn't it? Yeah. 
And then that automatically puts Islands in fifth place, even though Islands was a good episode. Yeah, yeah, we had the um, Majungasaurus, which was, you know, a, a, an epic dinosaur to see. Yes. Um, I think it's just that the other episodes have just been a little bit stronger in areas. They just, by default, put Islands at the bottom in fifth. Yes, I think so. <laughs> so, our ranking is in fifth place, we've got Islands. In fourth place, we've got Oceans. In third place, we've got the Badlands. Second place is Swamps. And in first place is North America. So what do you think of that ranking, guys? Let us know if you agree. If you disagree, put your own ranking in the comments below. Let us know what you thought. On that note, guys, please, if you've enjoyed this podcast episode, please give us a like there. Drop a comment down below with your favourite episode and your favourite scene. And share it with someone who also loves Prehistoric Planet 2. And don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss future videos.